Often you hear that insight is a matter of seeing things as they are. The actual phrase in Pali, though, means seeing things as they've come to be. In other words, we're looking at processes. We're seeing things as they function. Because we want to figure out how to take those functions and use them for a good purpose, putting it into suffering. Like right now as you're meditating. You're bringing an intention to the present moment, and the intention is to stay with one object. That object is the breath, and it's good to hold in mind a perception about the breath, that it's not just air coming in and out of the nose, but it's a sense of energy flow in the body. And you notice when you change the perception, you change what you actually experience. This gives you some inkling to the fact that what you're going to experience has a lot to do with what you bring to the experience. Because after all, that's the message of the Four Noble Truths. It's because we approach our experience with ignorance that we're going to suffer. And part of that ignorance has to do with the the processes that go after sensory contact, sights coming to the eyes, sounds to the ears, smells to the nose, taste to the tongue, tactile sensations to the body, ideas appearing in the mind. We're ignorant about how we deal with these things and shape them afterwards. But how we shape them beforehand is an even bigger mystery. But that's where a lot of the, the teachings are aimed. Now the term, things as they've come to be, has a special meaning. Because the Buddha says our problem is that we fall for the craving that leads to becoming. And becoming is your sense of who you are in a particular world of experience. But that sense of who you are and that sense of the world have been shaped by a lot of things. And if you just take it as a given, you're going to miss an awful lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes. But if you look at it as it has come to be, then you begin to understand how these things form. Because once it's becoming, your two reactions, one, you want the becoming to continue, or you want it to be destroyed. You find yourself in a particular situation and you don't like it. You don't like your identity, you don't like who you are, or you don't like the world around you. And there's a destructive impulse there. That's called craving for non-becoming. The Buddha says both of those cravings lead to more becoming. Because as long as you think of yourself as somebody in a world, even if you want to destroy that world, destroy that somebody. That frame of thinking carries you on. You cling to that particular idea, and around that clinging comes another sense of self and another sense of the world. So as the Buddha says, the way out is to look at these things as they come to be. In other words, the processes that lead up to becoming. You trace it back to clinging and then craving, feeling, sensory contact, the senses name and form, in other words, your sense of the body, activities of the mind, consciousness, fabrication. Fabrication here is three things. Bodily fabrication, your in and out of breath, verbal fabrication, your thoughts about an object, then you direct your thinking to an object, then you evaluate it, you make comments on it, make, ask questions about it. Then there are feelings and perceptions. Those are mental fabrications. And then those are based on ignorance, usually, which is why we suffer. But if we bring some knowledge to these processes, then we can begin to see things as they've come to be. 
That's what happens that these are the things we're focused on as we meditate. You watch the breath. You get very conscious about how you talk to yourself. All too many people, when they hear that the first level of right concentration has directed thought and evaluation, they say, well, how do you do that? And the answer is, it's something you're doing already. It's part of your internal conversation, but the conversations that are going on ever since you learned language. It's just that for the sake of concentration, you're going to be very conscious about what you're directing your thoughts to and what kind of evaluation is useful. Like right now, evaluating the breath to make it comfortable, that's a useful use of your powers of evaluation. Because you're trying to make a good place here, a good place to stay. We're surrounded by the heat right now. But as long as you have that perception of being surrounded by the heat, it gets oppressive. So switch your perception over to the breath. The breath can permeate the body. Some people even feel a breath energy around the body like a cocoon. Take that as your object. Or you can think of thoughts of goodwill as your meditation object, but it's the same sort of thing. You have to breathe calmly as you're developing the goodwill, and then you direct your thoughts to all beings. May all beings be happy. And then you evaluate that wish. Are there any beings out there that you, you feel hypocritical about saying that for? Well, why is that? What's the problem? In other words, if you want your goodwill to be genuine, you have to think it through. Remind yourself that very few people feel they've been justly punished when they are punished for their misdeeds. So why do you wish punishment on them? Why do you wish for anybody to suffer? The best thing would be for them to have a change of heart, see the error of their ways, and behave in better ways. So try to wish that for all the beings that you find hard to have goodwill for. And hold in mind that perception that it, it's good for you and it's good for them. Some people say, I don't think they deserve my goodwill. It's not the question of their deserving or not deserving, it's a question of your needing your goodwill to ensure that you don't do or say or think anything unskillful. Because if you have ill will for somebody, it's really easy to say, well, I'm justified in speaking in unskillful ways and acting in unskillful ways. Because that other person has been so unskillful. If your behavior depends on their behavior, you're living in a very dangerous world. You have to find the resources inside that allow you to say, okay, I can have goodwill for these beings. Like my heart can be large enough to encompass their happiness. And as you think that, you realize you've learned something important. You do have these resources inside to do and say and think things that are really skillful. In which case, you don't have to depend on resources outside. In other words, other people's goodness or the, the goodness of the environment. And you're a lot safer if you have this independent source of strength inside. It's the same with the body. When the Buddha talks about the body, he says it's composed of different properties. The word in Pali is tattu. Sometimes that's translated as elements makes it sound like it, the chemical elements, which is not. It's more the qualities of warmth, coolness, energy, solidity in the body. And as the Buddha notes, many of these properties are really potentials. The heat potential, for example, can get greater or lesser. The same with the coolness of water, or the energy of the, the breath. The theory is that they're provoked. And you notice this as you, as you work with the breath, 
change your perception of the breath, and the breath feels different. Change your perception of the solidity of the body, and the body feels different. Think of it, of all the atoms composing the body. We all know from science that atoms are mostly space. The nucleus of each atom proportionally is a tiny, tiny thing. So hold that perception in mind. Your body is mainly space. And it doesn't have to be heavy. Or you can think of the coolness of water. That's a good perception to hold in mind right now. Which parts of the body are the cooler, cooler than the other parts? Wherever that may be, focus your attention there. And then think of that coolness seeping through the rest of the body. And if you can hold to the perception strongly enough, consistently enough, you see that it actually does change your experience of the body. And the same thing applies to the qualities of the mind. The Buddha applies the same theory about tattu or properties or potentials. He says you have the potential for a lot of unskillful things in the mind. Like there's the potential for sensuality. You start thinking about things that are beautiful, things that are attractive, and that stirs up the potential, as or in the terms of they use in Pali, it provokes it. And so they find your mind overrun with thought, thoughts of sensuality. But good potentials. For example, there's the potential for effort. I remember the very first time in John Fuang said that we were going to be sitting all night in meditation. My first thought was, I can't possibly do that, and I don't have enough strength to make it all the way through the night. And on top of that, he was going to be sitting with a group of lay people, and he didn't want me there. He wanted me to go off and sit and meditate on my own. So I didn't even have the support of the group. But then I started thinking. The Johns in the past who sat up all night, it's not that their bones were made out of iron. They probably have the same physical properties that I have in my body. And they had the same potentials for weakness, but also potentials for strength. Where are those potentials for strength? And I was able to think in those terms. I found I could tap into some unexpected reserves. I made it all the way through the night. And I realized that a lot of the problem had been the limits I had imposed through my own perceptions. So be very careful about the perceptions you bring to your experience, because they can provoke helpful things in the body and the mind or unhelpful things in the body and the mind. And you realize we're not here just to see things as they are. We're see, here to see things as they function and then try to take advantage of those potentials. Because among other things, we have the potential for energy, we have the potential for, for mindfulness, the potential for all kinds of good qualities. And John Lee made that comment. He said, Human beings have lots of potentials, both physical and mental, that they don't take advantage of. And it's a shame. There's a lot of good we can do as we explore these potentials. So we're not here to be as passive as possible, to say that we're seeing things just as they are. Look at the way the Buddha approached awakening. He didn't just sit there passively. He tried different approaches. He focused his mind in different places. He took different things as his themes of his meditation. And then he evaluated it. How did it work? What was he able to do? And what was not up to his expectations? And then the question always was, well, what am I doing wrong? And he would turn around and check out other possibilities. He experimented, which meant that he had to act and then look at the results of his actions, 
pass judgment on them, and then decide what to do next based on the judgment, is through this process of committing himself to doing what he thought was the wisest and most skillful thing to do, and then reflecting on it, that he was able to come up with some good standards for judgment, and that's what the Four Noble Truths are. Standards for judgment. What kind of actions are worth doing, which ones are not worth doing? What kind of actions lead to suffering, what kind of actions lead away? By applying that framework, he found that he could learn an awful lot about how things function. and how you can steer their functioning in the direction of the end of suffering. So this is why we meditate. If the problem of suffering were caused by sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, we'd have to go out and change them. But here it's caused by the things we bring to sensory contact. And those are things that are happening in the mind. This is why the meditation aims inside does its work inside. Now, in some cases we work outside and move in. In other words, we practice generosity, we observe the precepts, and that trains the mind. Then we use that trained mind to look deeper into the mind. But it's never a question of just sitting there and looking at whatever comes up in the mind. You're trying to get the mind to act in as skillful a way as possible in its thoughts and its words and its deeds. And then you learn from that in the quest to create even more skill. Which is why the insights that you gain from acting in this way are insights about action, the power of action, the nature of causality. Insight into how things function. especially when you can get them to function in the best way possible. <laughs>